Lord Luce here, obviously in your capacity as Chancellor of the University of Gibraltar. You've been a periodic visitor, obviously, yeah, you haven't yeah. come for the first time in 19 years, but what other changes have you, have you noticed? Well, I think, I do think Gibraltar is more prosperous uh, than it was 19, 20 years ago. Um, I think that's good for the people, but I also am struck that some of the social welfare is better still. Uh, and if you take um, the accommodation, uh, the, the support for old people, those who have mental health problems particularly, I think there have been conversions, of course, of, of the hospital, the old service hospital, naval hospital, I think it was, and all these things have led to big improvements. So I'm struck by that, and I think that's marvellous. Have you had an opportunity to speak to the present government uh, yes, in your visit? Yes, I've had the pleasure of talking to the Chief Minister and, of course, lengthily to uh, Mr. Lakudi, who's been associated with the university from the beginning. And um, what did you discuss? Well, uh, in terms of uh, higher education, I had very full discussions about how the university may develop or what its future may be, how we ensure that it's the highest possible quality of uh, academic uh, achievement. When you spoke to the Chief Minister, I I'm sure that you must have discussed Brexit. What is your view of the current state, the impasse in the, in the Parliament in the UK and the prospects of that getting unlocked I in a favourable way? Well, I've been in public life for a long time. I was a member of the House of Commons for 21 years and been a member of the House of Lords for about 13 years. And I've never seen a political paralysis of this kind ever before. We've seen crises. Uh, in my young days before I ever got into Parliament, we had Suez when uh, uh, British troops were involved. Uh, it looked like a war, but in fact it was over in a few days, and it marked the end of an empire. It was a passing incident. Then in the 1970s, when I was a young member of Parliament, we had trade unions trying to run the country. And many people here will remember what happened then. And again, there was chaos in London, but at that time, there was political leadership in all parties. And uh, an alternative administration was sitting there waiting to take over, took the form of Margaret Thatcher, 1979, and trying to sort out those problems. We joined the European Union, and we were challenged by Americans like Dean Asherson. Britain's lost an empire. They haven't found a role. We did find a role. We went into the European Union. Most people understood it to be a common market, not a federation. And it's when later on the Eurozone was formed with Germany and France in the lead that the tension began to build up in Britain because it's not really what people voted for. That's partly why we are where we are now. But the worst of all was the referendum. And that was a very, very bad decision to have a referendum without preparation, like without giving people a chance to learn from Parliament and parliamentarians to learn what was at stake. Because why did we all vote? so many people vote for it? It was because we wanted more prosperity by trade. We wanted to prevent another world war from ever taking place in Europe. That's, so now, that's the original vote to join the European was, economy. And that was my reason and the reason of so many of my colleagues in Parliament for voting to go in mm -hmm. to the common market, which mm -hmm. is what it was. I think one has to remember these things. I think we've been rather half-hearted in Britain in our membership and it's become more half-hearted as time has gone on. And I think there's been a lack of leadership by governments, successive governments, in really getting in there and being an active participant and trying to shape it in the way that we think would be best for Europe. And that has been a failure. So now we've got to decide our future. And it's uh, a paralysis of the worst order. I don't, if I knew the answer and the way out, I think I'd probably be Prime Minister now, because <laughs> no one knows the answer, no one knows the way out. Uh, but we've got to, politicians have got to take a deep breath, and they've got to be able to discuss these issues in friendliness. And the media's got to help. The media in Britain has got to help more, and be constructive. And then, after that, we'll have to see what the best way forward is. You're talking about leadership and potentially... A, well, 
a lack of leadership in, in, in recent years on this topic. Um, Theresa May has been unable to pull her colleagues with her in, in the direction that she sees best uh, for the UK. Uh, and meanwhile, Jeremy Corbyn, as opposition leader, has been criticised for largely standing by and equivocating instead of trying to show a clear direction uh, in which to, to, to try to you know, pull the, the government and, and the people of the UK. Is the, the UK Parliament waiting for potentially a different personality, a political leader, uh, to, to really pull people in a particular direction? Well, remember, we've got a hung Parliament. That doesn't help. Uh, if there was one party with a big majority, they might have been able to try and unravel this. But remember, too, that both the main parties are themselves divided on Europe. So that they, if you had an election today, there wouldn't be any clarity. People would say, well, what's the difference between Labour and Conservative? They're all confused. They don't know what they want. So that's not going to, at the moment, answer the problem. Uh, and the question then is how to take this forward. I think, and I'm going to stick my neck out a bit here, that in a crisis like this, it may be best to let those who are fairly strong, I don't agree with their views, on leaving, to take the responsibility on their shoulders and then they have to face up to what is the British interest uh, and the interest of Gibraltar, I have to say very strongly, because many of us in Parliament are aware of Gibraltar's situation. And I think things will emerge now as the Prime Minister fades away, that's what's happening, mm -hmm. a new leader will have to be chosen. And I suspect we're going to see some fairly traumatic times still until something will emerge some development will emerge. Do you think it might have to get worse before it gets yeah, better? Yes, that's my view. I think it has to get worse. We have to take a deep breath and we have to get through this. But my goodness, we've got to go back to the days when we're courteous to each other in Britain. Uh, that has been one of the most uh, sad things that uh, I've seen. Is It's not just in Parliament where people have been offensive to each other but it is within the media and it is uh, poisoning relations between people in society. Mm. And this has got to end and there's got to be a period of healing. Uh, the great Commonwealth statesman called, many people may remember, leader of India, Mr. Nehru, said the point of the Commonwealth is that it gives a touch of healing. And I think what we do need is a touch of healing after all this is over. You've mentioned the Commonwealth there. Um, is that uh, a body that you think Gibraltar will be able to um, engage with fruitfully if its, uh, if its relationship with the European Union is somewhat diluted? I think irrespective of the outcome for all of us in terms of Europe, whether we're in or out, the Commonwealth can be of benefit to Gibraltar. I have absolutely, I've been having discussions here. I'm a very strong believer in the Commonwealth. I'm chairing a group in the House of Lords which is putting pressure on the government to use our chairmanship of the Commonwealth to do positive things. And I'm delighted that things are beginning to develop in Gibraltar. Of course, Gibraltar has always been a member of a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, so Gibraltar is familiar with the Commonwealth. But I would like to see this a focal point here, moving out, linking up with the universities in the Commonwealth, linking up with businesses in the Commonwealth, linking up with all sorts of uh, people, magistrates, judges. There are associations throughout the Commonwealth. Now, modern technology provides that opportunity. It's an opportunity to network and to develop business. And uh, I think the, uh, the opportunities for Gibraltar are there, and I will do whatever I can to help Gibraltar achieve this. You mentioned support for Gibraltar within the general Brexit chaos. Um, for somebody who feels like perhaps we're a little bit vulnerable um, in this situation, um, there has been a petition which has garnered 14,000 signatures, which was taken to the UK Parliament and the Prime Minister's office, asking for representation, direct representation in Westminster. What would you say to those individuals? It's an interesting, it's an interesting idea. 14,000 is a formidable uh, number. I think the first thing I'd say is remember in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords, there is an undercurrent of massive support for Gibraltar. 
you may not see it every day, but the number of parliamentarians who've been down here in the past few years are enormous. And I see it every day in the House of Lords. If something blows up about Gibraltar, there's always a quick conversation between a group of us. We better take some action. We better see the minister. We better put down a question, whatever it is. So Gibraltar must never underestimate that even now, with what is indirect uh, link uh, with, with, with the parliamentarians, it's, it's all there. The support is all there. I think as a result of the last three years, the very close working between the government of Gibraltar and the United Kingdom government has been very, very effective, actually. They've worked together to try and look uh, at the contingencies. How do we deal with the European Union? End result, closer links with Britain, closer links with the United Kingdom as a whole. So that leads to your question. And I, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, there is one way you could have uh, a non-elected uh, system where you could appoint uh, a Gibraltarian to the House of Lords, or two Gibraltarians to the House of Lords. That could, could be done. That's not direct election, but it's a, it would provide a direct link. Uh, you could certainly, where you had MEPs who um, Gibraltarians have been voting yesterday on that, just mm -hmm. been voting recently. Uh, so it is possible but it would be part of a general picture. How close would Gibraltarians like to be to the United Kingdom? We're already very close. What kind of relationship do you want? Or do you want to have more self-determination uh, and uh, but keep our link? That, that, that's the big decision. So I shall be interested to see how the discussion goes. And um, you mentioned MEPs. Is there any comment to make about uh, these European elections? Well, I have no idea of the outcome. Uh, the uh, uh, former Russian foreign minister, Mr. Molotov, once said, the trouble about elections, you don't know what the result is going to be. Uh, and that is the beauty of democracy. We don't know what the result is going to be, but it will be fairly traumatic uh, in the United Kingdom. And there will be a lot of further deep thinking about how the political scene is going to develop. We just have to wait and see. And in respect of your links with Gibraltar, the Loose Foundation has continued to provide opportunities to youngsters, adventure training um, in both the UK and in nearby Spain. Yeah, I'm, my wife and I are both patrons of the Loose Foundation, which was set up as we left Gibraltar as, as governor. And I'm, we're both delighted with the way it's gone. There are now 300 alumni. These are young school children who are given the opportunity to experience adventure training outside Gibraltar. At the moment, there's adventure training taking place with 15 of them in near outside Cadiz. Uh, we've had it in the United Kingdom. We've had them over to Scotland. We've had them over to places like Dorset for adventure training. I'm inclined to the view that Spain is a good place to do it. There are so many opportunities there. And I'm really pleased that we have 300 alumni, and I hope that they all feel they've had long-term benefit from that experience. So will you be able to use the Loose Foundation as uh, an excuse, as it were, to come back to Germany? Very much, very much. It'll be our 20th anniversary next year, so you never know. That's a threat to the people. I may be back. <laughs> well, we look forward to talking to you again if you, if you do return. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your time, Lord Loose. Thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Okay.